Hello and welcome to another edition of the Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast. I'm Captain Rick Riles. Hey, this didn't, just didn't any edition. This would be our Thanksgiving edition, and oh my word. Tell you what, we got a few problems, but overall, our sportsmen in Florida have got a whole lot to be thankful for. For starters, we live in Florida, okay? It may be chilly, but it ain't cold. If, you, if you've seen the Buffalo football field recently, you know that it's uh, it's pretty darn nice here in Florida. But, hey, we all made it back to the dock safely this year. Gosh, a lot of people caught a lot of fish. Can't wait to talk to the guys. I got a question for them this week. Here's what we're going to find out from all the areas of Florida. We'll start up in the northeast, work our way down the east coast, up the west, and out the panhandle. And there is no doubt we've got an increase in sharks. And I want to know how it's impacted our guys' fishing. I know it's impacted mine. Uh, my favorite fishing, as you all know, is to do is sail fish in the summertime off of Stewart. And you know what? We got rid of that 16-pound test line. And we got rid of that ultralight tackle. We went to a little heavier tackle. Not big rods and reels or anything. We're still fishing the small, small talicas. But we tighten those drags up a little bit. And probably even more importantly, uh, Captain George Labonte, who has mentored me a lot on sailfish, taught me that when that fish gets away from the boat and starts acting tired, you go get him. And you get him released in good shape. Been very fortunate. Haven't seen one get hit by a shark, but a lot of guys have. And I know it's changed a lot of the places and the methods that the guys use. I want to hear about it. And, of course, we'll get our fishing reports, too. It's not fall anymore. It's turning wintertime in Florida. It has been chilly for the last uh, week or so anyway. So let's find out what the dropping water temperatures have meant to our fishermen. The Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast is brought to you this week and every week by Yamaha. Reliability starts here. By Shimano, bringing people and nature together. By Tournament Master Chum. Oh, it's the best chum on earth, all right. By Nasara Paradise Rentals, your dream vacation. By DOA Lures, the unfair advantage. By Young Boats, you want the finest in flats, bay, and offshore hybrids? You need to check out youngboats.com. By the Castaway Hat Company, that's the hat that's helping save our seas. And by Academy Sports and Outdoors, right stuff, low price every day. Our first stop is in Nassar, Costa Rica, because I understand the bill fishing up there has been very good this week, and I want to get the word from Craig Sutton, then we'll hit the coast of Florida. Let's check in with Captain Craig and see how things are in Nassar. We got a lot to be thankful for, don't we, Craig Sutton? You better believe it, and I'm going to make my 20, I think it's my 24th or 25th year in a row being down there Thanksgiving week, and buddy, I can't wait. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the fishing's been so bad here in northeast Florida, but, boy, it's been wide open down there. We had a super good week. A couple of nice marlin. One of them was a really nice marlin, probably 500-ish. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, it was a good fish, real good fish. They lost. They had. They actually had shots, and it sounds like about four more during the week, a couple here and a couple there that they missed. But um, they're – they're schooling or swimming with the, the mahi, the 18 to about 30-pound mahi, and the yellowfin are mixed in with them. And so it's – I think there's more marlin there than we realize. It's just the, the mahi and the yellowfin are just, you know, beating them to the bait. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but good fish in all multiple mahi days with yellowfin mixed in. Javier went uh, today and had – you know, fish for like two hours and got three yellowfin and four mahi. Come home, you know. Just gotcha. Good fishing. Good gotcha. weather too. Beautiful weather down there. Now, are you booked up Christmas through New Year's? Are you uh, everybody on vacation? No, it's, it's, no, we got a couple of little uh, bookings here and there and stuff. Really, for the small groups, we we don't have a lot of December where it's totally booked off. Um, and January's got a few dates, but yeah, there's some mud. Uh, some really prized dates. If somebody out there wants to go. I, we still got some good dates in Christmas. And it's usually a high demand, but the flights are a little bit higher than normal. But they're not that much higher. I mean, it, you know, it's what they were, you know, three years ago before COVID. Craig, I find it interesting. And and my son uh, hooked a gorgeous marlin down there that fought the way you hate to see him fight. Went deep, stayed deep. 
uh, didn't do much. And, and, um, God, I think, I think we were with Captain Wilson that day. I don't remember, but he asked me, uh, or Captain William, rather, excuse me. He asked me, so what do you think it is? I said, Cap, I got to be honest. I think it's a shark. He said, no, I promise you it's not a shark. He said, in Costa Rica, we get very few sharks and they're tiny. I wonder why that is. Yeah. And you know, I've seen them too down there, but, uh, on these big schools, primarily, you know, in, in our fall, which is the end of May through August. And some of the biggest marlin bites I've been on were literally, and I'm not talking about, they just didn't bite for a few minutes. They bit all day for every day for about five, six days. Uh, you know, just amazing numbers of marlin. And all the marlin you wanted. It was, and they were chasing bait the whole time. But if you, we switched over to live bait and when the rare times that our live baits would get tired, they dropped down a little bit in the water column. And we're not talking about very much, like maybe five, six feet and, and swimming and the sharks would get them. But these were all, you know, 15, you know, eight to 15, 16 pound little. Yeah. Little isn't that crazy? Sharks. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's I mean, that's just nuts to me. I'll be darned. That's just nuts yeah, to me. Yeah, and I've seen that the fish being it's really defined layered, very definite, you know, very definite many times down there on these real especially the really, really good bites too. Hmm. Um, that, that's but, crazy if 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 Yeah, that those those bites I was telling you about what yeah. was cool about it was there were several times in the days I got to fish and that we had a client from South Florida, uh, 3M guy, that uh, fished three days and, and did just amazing numbers. But I, we actually felt like the marlin were going to come in the boat when they were free jumping or, or chasing bait. Wow. I mean, and not just once. It was several times they'd be. And they, you'd see them greyhounding after a 20-pound a mahi or a 20-pound yellowfin from a half a mile away, and they're chasing after it. And they'd get right to our boat 10, 15 feet away, and they just hit the water and go right underneath us and keep chasing after wow, it. Wow, that is and we cool. And were, we were fixed. There were several, I'm telling you, in the three days, there were several times we were getting ready to hit the deck. That is <laughs> cool. I'll be darned. It's the first time I've ever seen, I felt like they were, you know, they were the predators and we were the, we were the bait or the yeah, fish, I'd... The species. <laughs> I bounced one off the side of the, a blue one off the side of the Dos Amigos one day, but it wasn't, it, it was by accident. He was just grounded. He didn't know what, but he knew he wanted to get rid of that hook. Cap, we appreciate it as always. Tell everybody how they can get a hold of you if they want to come down to Nassara. And oh, by the way, if my wife does happen to listen to this podcast, that is what I want for Christmas. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, it's 904. 591-2161 or the email Craig at fishingthesaw.com. Did you hear that, honey? I hope so. All right. Thank you, brother. We'll talk with you Bye. next week. Captain Craig Sutton. All right. Now it's time to hit Florida. Let's head up to the Northeast and check in with Captain David Boris. David, how we doing? Hey, Ricky. I'm trying to stay warm, buddy. <laughs> Had a little cold snap this week. and uh, But, you know, even with the cold cold temperatures, we had water temperature drop down about 62. Uh, I heard some guys said they saw 61. Uh, but, you know, that's uh, that's pretty low for us. But the fish were still biting. Had some really good reports this weekend. I was really surprised. I mean, Saturday, Rick, uh, we limited out on our red. We got our limit of red. And I had a couple of young teenage boys uh, fishing with their dad. And they really did a good job. Once we figured out what the pattern was, we stuck with that. And we were quite successful. Uh, had some really nice red, some trout, and uh, released a few flounder. And uh, all in all, you know, it was a, a really good day considering the winds were blowing uh, out of the north. And uh, the temperature was a little chilly. And we, we never got out of our jacket. We, we, you know, we stayed bundled up pretty much most of the day. I'll be darned. Now, uh, that, also, was, that was Saturday? That was Saturday, I'll yep. And also some good reports on sheephead. Uh, saw some guys coming to the cleaning table with, uh, you know, eight or nine sheepheads. So, uh, and, and they seem to say, you know, 
it was hard finding them, but once you found them, you were on them. You know, stay there, and you're going to catch quite a few. Okay. And I found that to be sort of the case with the trout this week, too. You had to look for them, but once you found them, there were some good trout. We, we're seeing some some really good good trout in the last few weeks. Um, not any really big numbers, but the quanti- the quality is really up there. Uh, some guys, uh, there was a report I heard uh, a guy had a 30-incher up next to his Woo! boat and he got off. So some guys have seen some big trout. We had a few big ones uh, this week. And, you know, this is, to me, the time of year. If you're going to harvest trout, this is a good time to do it. You know, the spawn is over with. Uh, these are fish that come in off the ocean. Uh, they're really nice fish. The other day we had uh, several. Uh, our biggest was 19 inches, and our smallest was uh, 16 inches. I'll be uh, darned. That's, so, that's good fish, yeah. David. Yeah. You have some really good fish, really good quality fish, too. Yeah, but isn't it, isn't it the same way all the time, David, when it starts to get cold, when it drops down to 60 degrees? Don't you generally see your fish uh, school tighter? Yeah, they do. They sure do. Uh, you know, and, and like I said, you know, this is to me, I would rather harvest trout this time of year than in the early spring. Early spring, you get those big trout come in, and that's when those big female are coming in to spawn. And, uh, you know, you do, you got to be careful in the springtime with those big trout. And when you go to release them, you got to, you got to handle them real gently. And, uh, a lot of times we will, I won't even let my clients handle them. I'll just pretty much pick them up with the boat of grips, uh, try not to handle them, get their photographs and release the fish on it and put it on its way. Get them gone in a At hurry. This time of year, there's no, there's no rope in these fish, you right. know, so. But get yep. them, get them gone in a hurry. Hey, David, it's Thanksgiving weekend, and um, I've just yep. got got so much to be thankful for. What's David Borey's the most thankful for on the water uh, this year? You know, Rick, we 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 all we all should count our blessings. We all we all uh, have a lot to be thankful for. Uh, being fishermen here in in Florida, uh, Florida is just a great state to live in. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really thankful about uh you know i'm happy with the fact that they brought the redfish back down to one fish per person mm-hmm. I, I really like that I, i'm thankful for that that's the one thing i i i, I think uh i'm real happy with that you I'm know real happy with that uh, yeah and that was a major move for us and i was pleased by what percentage of the fishermen supported it a huge percentage of the fishermen supported it which i thought was wonderful you know i well, and you it, know rick you, you know we were shocked whenever they when they came up with it because it just came out of the blue we were like what two two redfish per person yeah. i mean nobody was complaining or anything like that and then the next thing we know they're giving us two redfish per person which like you said <laughs> Nobody we really didn't ask for it. Most of the anglers that I knew, you know, were happy with the one per person. And but I'm glad to see they're back to that again. Yeah, I am too. I'm I'm glad of that. There's no doubt. And you know, something that I'm thankful for as a fisherman every year, David. As I fe- as I look at history, we're about the third generation that that ever fished for the fun of it. You ever think about that? I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, our yeah. grandfathers fish for the fun of it, but their fathers didn't fish for the fun of it. And I'm just always so thankful that nobody is depending on what I catch during the day to determine what they're going to eat for dinner that night. I got news for you, Cap. Debbie Riles is going to eat for dinner whatever Debbie Riles wants, and I'm thankful for that. I sure am. David, we appreciate it so much. Please tell me we can check with you next week. Looking forward to it, Rick. Thank you, Captain David Borries. The year was 1953 when one of the true pioneers of big game fishing just hung it up. No, it wasn't any of our podcasters. It was none other than Ernest Hemingway. I just don't want to do it anymore, he's credited with saying. The tackle has become so sophisticated, the fish just don't have a chance. Can you imagine walking him through the aisles of Strike Zone Fishing and showing him the latest and greatest from Shimano? Can you imagine handing him a Saragusa spinner that weighs less than his bait did and could put more torque on a rampaging tuna than the giant old reels of his day? 
Now, Ernest, I'm afraid you left us way too early. The fights with great fish still go on today, and sometimes we still get beat. But if I were a sea monster of your day, I think I'd still rather do battle with you than face the tools that Shimano has stocked in Strike Zone Fishing 68 years later. Our thanks to David Boris for a great Northeast Florida report. Now let's head down to East Central and check in with Captain Jim Ross. How are we doing, Jimmy? We're doing good this week, Rick. Good, good. Now things were a little uh, slow last time we talked. Yeah, but you know, we got Thanksgiving week. There's going to be a lot of people off this week for a couple of days, and it looks like the bite has really gotten better. You know, that hurricane that came through really messed things up, and in conjunction with the, the tailing end of that full moon, that really just kind of made everything kind of screwy down here in the Central East region, but it's changing for the better, and hopefully the guys and gals out there will get a chance to get out this week and take advantage of it. Now, I don't know about the offshore crew, but I can tell you that the inshore stuff is really getting much, much better, even with these cold fronts that we've had. I was Captain, uh, Captain Mike Mann. I was talking with him the other day, and he has been catching lots and lots of uh, fish up in the Mesquite Lagoon from George's Bar around the Oak Hill area, Lafise, old the old Lafise Fish Camp area, north all the way up to the South Bridge at New Smyrna. He's catching mangrove snapper, black drum, uh, ladyfish, jacks, redfish, snook. It's just a really, really good time of the year uh, to be fishing if you can get out. And here's the secret to the shallow water fishery. As these cold fronts come through, it pushes the fish down into the cold, into the deeper water. As the, you know, as the temperatures warm, those fish start to sneak back out. So find areas of transition between deeper water and shallower water that are, that are close to one another where the fish don't have to travel a long way to go from a deep to a shallow area. And you're going to find areas that are consistently holding fish throughout our lagoon system. I got you. Well, I, now tell me about your water clarity, Jim. It was so stirred up before. Has it gotten a little better? It has. Um, even with the hurricane, you know, we didn't get a whole lot of rain off this last hurricane. And there are areas, I've fished the Banana River, and I've fished some areas where I could actually still see bottom in two, two and a half feet of water. You can see the difference between the Calorpa and the sand spots. And as we, you know, as we get farther into the winter, hopefully it will continue to stay clear like that. We've also got areas up in the north end of the Mosquito Lagoon, like I was just talking about, the areas that uh, Edgewater, Oak Hill, that Mike Mann has been fishing. On that hurricane, we didn't get as much rain as we got with, with the previous hurricane, right. Ian. N Nicole, though, brought a huge storm surge, which brought actually a bunch of cleaner ocean water in to the lagoon. And that cleaner water is still kind of staying in the lagoon. It hasn't really transitioned back out, but yet it hasn't really gotten stirred up. So overall, our water clarity right now really isn't too bad. Ah, it's a good thing. That's a good thing, and I'm glad to hear your fish are biting. I think offshore has been pretty well closed for the last week or so. Hey, Jim, I've been, this time of year, I always get kind of reflective and thinking about how the year's been and such, and I have never in 50, well, now it's 60 <laughs> years of fishing offshore uh, seen the sharks like we've got them right now. How much have sharks impacted your fishing in the last five to ten years? Well, I can tell you, Rick, um, there are 50, 40 to 50%, I would, I would say, of the fish that we currently catch, the snook, the redfish, the trout, um, even the triple tail that we currently catch along the near shore waters have got some kind of shark damage on them or wow. get sharks themselves. Yeah, it is, it is a surprising amount. Now, the majority of these are from smaller sharks, it seems like, maybe a little fine tooths or a little black tips or things like that. But, you know, there are plenty of bigger sharks roaming our beaches. We get tiger sharks. We get hammerheads on, our, on a regular basis here. And then, of course, the bull sharks that we get in the lagoon system. We're catching bull sharks in the lagoon system on the flats when we're chunking for, you know, throwing uh, chunks of bait for the redfish. Right. And we're, we're getting bull sharks in the lagoon on a much, much more regular basis now. So. It seems like whenever you take a species off of the hit list, off of the commercial hit list, that is, uh, that species then begins to thrive uh, because we have got a huge, huge change in the shark population along our nearshore waters. Now, I have not been fishing offshore as long as you have, but I can tell you this. 
it is very rare for me to talk to any of the guys that consistently go offshore fishing for amberjack to tell me that they caught three fish in a row. Oh, they yeah. might get one. They they may even get two up off of a wreck or a piece of reef. But that third fish that gets hooked gets sharked. And as soon as one shark shows up, it's like a shark NATO. There are, there's a swarm of them. And the sandbar and bull sharks on our reefs and wrecks are absolutely um, overwhelming at times. And, you know, we see it even even just trying to catch sea bass or trigger fish. Yep. Just yep. the number of sharks that are out on our reefs in that 70 to 200 foot range is just amazing. Um, you know, we've even we've even gotten to the point now where you know those those fish like triple tail. You used to never see triple tail with shark damage to them. They would beat beat themselves up during spawning season, and they would rub on a on a piece of chain or you know something from a buoy here and there. But to have as many shark bitten triple tail as we have that's saying something because that's not an easy fish to identify for most other species of fish it looks like a piece of debris floating in the water but the sharks are catching on to it they're not stupid and uh i think every species we have right now is in some way shape or form uh you know being they're 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 being attacked on you know on a daily basis now from the sharks that we have up and down our coastal waters not just not just offshore anymore yeah steve darty our associate editor wrote an article for last month that said it's actually changed the sailfish migration whereas they used to move into an area and stay and feed now they're one place and and uh they stay there three four days and then they're gone and and they, they gotta, have, they they gotta have find to them again and they have to and unfortunately up here in northeast florida what i've seen jim is the uh sharks are learning about boats and I've talked to a bunch of offshore captains at Kingfish every day, and the sharks will get in an area to where the minute you slow the boat down to put your baits out, you'll you'll go to put a bait out and go, ah, oh, don't 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 do that, and and they will have actually come to the boat waiting for you to hook their dinner. So it's uh it's scary stuff. You and I both know that the creator uh, built things the way he did for a reason. And yep. that they, they all fit into a perfect balance, and we are screwing the balance up. We are, we've done it with Red we've, Snapper, we've done it with Goliath Grouper, and we've done it with sharks. Yeah, and unfortunately, when you do it to the apex predators like that, detrimental things happen to the other species in that, in that fishery. And, you know, especially, especially our, you know, our near coastal species with the snook coming, coming uh, on as strong as they have in the last few years. The sharks are really keen on snook, especially at the inlet, the Bastion Inlet, Canaveral, and Ponce Inlet. It's it's a daily it's a daily occurrence that that you see shark bites on these fish or get your shark attacked while you're trying to catch it. That's crazy, Jim. We always appreciate it so much, and and I'm very thankful uh, for the great reports you've given us this year, and even more for close to 25 years of friendship. Now, Cap, we'll we'll talk <laughs> again next week if that's all right with you. I look forward to it, Rick, and hopefully everybody and happy Thanksgiving. Get out there, enjoy the time with your family, and you know, just try and enjoy everything that the Creator gave us. Ain't that the truth? Thank you, Cap. Well said. You know, I bet you don't even remember the days that all us cool kids would rub baby oil mixed with iodine to help us get even darker in the summertime. Being burnt was cool, and even if you weren't a surfing legend, you sure looked the part. Oh man, if a bunch of us old guys paid the price for our vanity. We never knew the skin problem and health damage that awaited us. Today's fishermen have the options of being so much healthier in the sun than we ever thought of. Thanks in no small part to the Castaway Hat Company, who not only provides our podcasters with Castaway straw hats, but they make the coolest prints on the underside of the brims you ever saw. You may think your bimini top or t-top blocks the sun, but as an awful lot of SOGs can tell you, you can't have enough protection from sun damage. Do what we do. Put on the sunblock and put on your Castaway straw hat. You'll look the part of today's best anglers, and you'll even be helping the environment. That's because for each Castaway hat sold, the Castaway Company is going to pay to have one pound of trash removed from our waterways. The burning Florida sun won't be raced in your skin, and believe me, when you age a few years, you'll thank us, old guys, with a lifetime on the water. So go to castawayhatco.com and get your best sun protection today. The Castaway Hat Company, they've got a hat for every adventure. 
Our thanks to Jim Ross for a good East Central report. Now, let's head on down to a place where I know somebody that's concerned about the shark population. Captain John Earhart. John, first of all, how's your fishing? Well, the fishing's been pretty good. It's been a little windy, so it's been hard to get offshore, but but the offshore fishing's been pretty steady. We've had a, a good mahi bite, uh, a lot of vermilion snappers, as usual, for November. That's, that's a uh, pretty common bottom fish you want to get during the month of November is the vermilion snappers. A few muttons, uh, a lot of kingfish. There's been a few sales. I, I think the next cold front, we're going to see some better sail fishing. You know, it, it, you're trolling quite a bit and covering a lot of ground for, for a few bites, but they are around. And a few wahoo and blackfin tuna are mixed in as well. So don't be afraid to run a planer, and you might catch a wahoo, kingfish, maybe even a big blackfin tuna. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, we're kind of on the cusp of it right now. When is the quickie tournament, as they call it, they run out of fish heads there? Uh, I think that's the first week of December. So it's only about, what, two weeks away. So uh, isn't, yep. that, isn't that generally regarded the kickoff of the sailfish season? Yeah, typically December 1st, everybody's, you know, they're rigging ballyhoos, they're rigging dredge mullets, and they're trolling all day trying to find where that big body of sailfish is. Mm-hmm. I got you. Speaking of big bodies of sailfish, our associate editor with Florida Sportsman, Steve Darty, wrote an article this month about how sharks are impacting the sailfish migration, that when the sails congregate in an area, pretty soon they got to split up and run for the hills because the sharks get after them. How much have sharks changed your fishing in the last five years, John? Uh, they've, they've changed the fish, my fishing techniques uh, drastically. Uh, you know, basically, like, sharks and goliath groupers have become just an absolute major problem, and we don't really realize how many actual fish that we're losing to the sharks on top of the sharks naturally catching these, these fish by themselves but we certainly are seeing that there is a big problem with sharks, especially on the Treasure Coast. You know, if you go bottom fishing and you're not reeling a fish in quickly, I can promise you within 10 drops, you're going to hook a shark or Goliath trooper. Yeah, yeah, I don't doubt it. i tell you what it did uh, for me, John. I got rid of a uh, 16-pound test, went to 30 on the sailfish reels, dialed the drags up, and, buddy, I'm going to tell you, we're fishing a lot tighter drags than we used to, and when that fish gets out, gets out away from us and uh, starts jumping like he's tired, we try to get on him just fast as we can and get him going. So far, I've been fortunate. I haven't seen one get hit by the sharks, but I'm sure it's happened. Yeah, and, and that's a good thing, too, because if, if you're fighting the sailfish for a shorter period of time, it's going to enable you to catch more sailfish. You're going to release that tailfish, and he's probably going to have a better survival rate because he's not fighting every last bit of energy out of his body. So, I mean, you know, it's going to give him a better release ratio so that if he does get released and there's a shark around, he's not going to get eating and eaten, and we won't even know that he got eaten. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Oh, sure I do. And I'm just praying that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I've lost some, but but fortunately I haven't seen it. Well, Cap, that sounds like a good report. We're right on the cusp of, of my favorite time of year down there, man. I tell you what, if you can get a good northwest wind so it stays calmer when you get out about five miles instead of from the east when it's nasty the whole way, I tell you what, that wintertime bite down in your neck of the woods, it can be world class, can it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if you know where the body of sailfish is and you can get your boat out there and your body can handle the beating, it's typically going to be well worth it. Yep, yep. I agree with you 100%. We appreciate it ever so much, Cap. We'll talk with you next week. Yep. All right. To it. Captain John Earhart from Stewart, Florida. Now let's head on down to Ala Mirada. Woo! I bet it's warmer down there than it is in Jacksonville. How about it, Beans? It's warmer down there? Yeah, it's a whopping 72 down here right now. That's pretty nice. That feels good compared to, what is it, about 46, 48 here. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, you know, it was chilly in that deer blind this afternoon, I promise you. Tell me what's going on with you fishing down there. Oh, well, uh, two days ago we had a, a little cold front, of course, and, uh, you know, fish weren't, you know, the happiest about that. We managed to get a nice wahoo before. Oh, 
Yeah, Astrid got to land her for her first Wahoo, probably about 40, 45 pounds uh, on, on a spinning rod, which is cool. And Way cool. Was that on a live bait, or what was the deal? No, you know, yeah, well, we actually just put a lure back on, a, like, a like an 8,500 spinner because we didn't have a conventional, and set the drag just nice on that, and uh, there he was. How about um, that? Really cool fish. Yeah, oh, yeah. What, and, kind, um, what kind of lure was it? Oh, it's a uh, it's a it's a, a bait strip company, but it's like these artificial bait strips. Uh, but if you search bait strips, it's made by a kid uh, that lives in Fort Lauderdale. His name is Elliot London, and he, he makes these Wahoo lures. They swear it's by. Huh, and it and it's like a Bonita strip, huh? Right, yeah, but it's just like uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we put it back, and the sun, the sun dipped down, and there there he was. I used to uh, I used to cut strips out of Naga hide when when I was having trouble keeping up with Bonita and pulled I caught an awful lot of fish, including sailfish, on a Naga hide strip. So what's been going yeah. on besides that Wahoo? Oh, uh, there's been a couple sailfish around. Uh, uh, seems like uh, snapper snapper bite's been pretty good too. Uh, just been some juvenile tarpon around in the back country. Uh, some more drum we're pushing down from that front. We're seeing some more red drum, a couple of blacks, and uh, uh, that's, that's pretty much what's going on for the most part. Lots of mackerel around. Holy cow, lots of mackerel. Uh, Good deal. King mackerel out front and Spanish mackerel out back. Good deal. Hey, Bean, before I let you go, uh, you haven't been, been fishing down there that long. I mean, you did when you were a kid, but I mean professionally. How much have sharks impacted you in oh the last few God. years? I was afraid of that. Oh my God, it's terrible. So it's 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 sad, and it doesn't seem like anything's going to be done about it. But yeah, uh, we have a horrendous shark problem down here. There's some days where you can't get a snook to the boat. I mean, uh, went back country fishing uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday, and you know you're not enjoying your snook anymore. You're you're just reeling them as fast as you can. And as far as yellow tailing goes, you know, the sharks kind of shut down the yellow tail bite pretty quick. As far as the tunas on humps go, there's days where you can't get the tunas uh, into the boat. Uh, you know, it's just getting to a point now, getting so bad, especially like in the last two years. Uh, this year, I just progressed getting worse and worse. But it's getting to the point now where there are some days where you can't get your fish into the boat. Yep. Yep. I've seen it up here in Jacksonville too, buddy. I, Red snapper have taken over all of our usual party ground uh, bottom fishing areas. I mean, by the thousands. And um, you'll drop a bait for a sea bass or a trigger fish. You can drop a piece of squid the size of the last knuckle on your little finger, Bean, and and hook a a 20-pound snapper and get him about three cranks and a big bull or a big sandbar has got him. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible. I get customers that ask me, they're like, well, at this point, what do you do? Like, uh, what, what, why do you do this? I'm like, well, what, what am I going to do? Quit fishing? No, but people, do I mean, that. Uh, you're, you're, there are some days uh, in the summer months that you're feeding 30, 40 snook to sharks. Ooh. And it's just Ooh, horrendous. And whether you get, whether you get them to the boat and then you release them and then it gets day after you release them. Yeah, we know that happens too. Anyway, I'm not going to dwell on the bad stuff. Sharks are a problem. There's no doubt about it. But this is Thanksgiving week, and hey, we got a lot to be thankful for. I am thankful for all the pilchers around right now. <laughs> you so, know what? I, you know what I'm thankful for? Huh? Your fiance's poor vision. Can you imagine yeah, if she ever got her yeah, vision I'm fixed? I'm thankful for that too. <laughs> you should I'm be. I'm most thankful for. It. I'm you, most thankful for that. You should be, and you can tell her I said it, Cap. Oh, uh, she'll, she'll hear the report. Please, please tell me we can check with you next week. Oh yeah, of course. Thanks, Bean, Captain Brandon Bean Storen from Isla Mirada, right there at Bud and Mary's. You know what Yamaha Outboards love? The genuine formula and consistency of Yamalu Marine Engine Oils. Blood, 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 blood. Outboards are subjected to punishing conditions like high loads, salt, and humidity, a mix that automotive oils can't handle. Yamalu full synthetic and marine performance formulas are certified to protect against friction and corrosion for reliable performance every time. Ah. Find Yamalu Marine Oils at your nearest Yamaha Outboard dealer. Locate them at yamahaoutboards.com backslash dealers. Yamaha. Reliability starts here. 
Hey, Raj, you know, being consistent is a mark of a quality product. If you've been Florida's number one chum for over 10 years, there's got to be a reason. For 10 years, Tournament Master Chum has lived up to his name. That's why more tournament pros insist on Tournament Master than any other chum. It's the only chum with Menhaden milk mixed right in. That means it gets the scent out faster and deeper than any other brand of chum. It comes in a grind size for every species from kingfish to catch and bait. Your fishing time is way too precious to use second-rate chum. Bring the action to you by insisting on Tournament Master Chum. It's worth every penny. When you're ready for the finest in custom-made flat spay or inshore-offshore hybrids, you are ready to meet the Young family in Inglis, Florida. For over 21 years, the Young family has built custom boats one at a time for every type of fishing. Nothing can sneak up on a flat quite like the Gulf Shore Flats boats, and I've never fished a better hybrid than the Young 24s and 27s. Rob Young is a naval architect who takes tremendous pride in each and every build for each and every customer that wants their boat custom-built exactly the way they want it is it time for you to move up are you ready to own the finest boat built then you need to visit the young boat facility in inglis florida or check them out online at youngboats.com all right let's leave alamorada let's swing over to Ten Thousand islands and talk to an action spotter that i'm speaking of thanksgiving i'm also thankful to have him as part of the team captain steve doll steve how we doing uh, i'm doing great rick i'm thankful to be a part of it that's Woo! Boy, there's a, we got a lot to be thankful for this year, Cap. First off, oh, we, and, and we most do. importantly, we all made it to the dock safely all year. Amen. Amen. That is, uh, that's priority number one. Yep, yep. For and sure. I'm, I'm thankful that you're uh, our team member to the north, Captain Greg Stamper, found his boat. He did. I just saw Greg uh, earlier today. So we got a plan in place, and uh, he's going to be back up and running. So going to be good. Good. When does he think he'll be back up and fishing, do you know? Well, we're going to lend him a boat, and uh, he's, he's actually coming to Armour, uh, coming over to our marina for a little bit, and uh, he's going to be working out of our marina, just kind of going, because we got some boats that we can get him into, so um, he's probably about 60 days out on his at this point, so, um, but he'll be back up and running, and, uh, you know, we're slowly, you know, the whole area slowly coming back people are you know coming down and checking on their places and um you know fishing is not their number one priority but the calls are really starting to come in for all of us and people are kind of chomping at the bit and you know as a curiosity people obviously want to see you know what is out there and you know it's uh human nature and i want to see you know how the landscape's changed and all that but people still want to fish too so we're uh we're getting out there, you know, that's for sure. And you know, more so our region than his is still, uh, you know, beat up a little bit, but we're doing pretty good. You know, it's uh, when, when we do get out, you know, it's really been the focus on this inshore bite. And, you know, it's that time of year. Fall is fantastic for that, you know, throughout our region. And um, our big three are the snook, the redfish, and the trout. Um, notably, the redfish are usually the, the toast of the town in October and November, and we're not seeing that huh. <laughs> as much. But, um, we're, but one thing we are seeing is we're finally seeing a small year class of rat red, and we've missed those in probably the last two, three years. So um, all of a sudden, it just started popping up, and within the last week, we're starting to see, you know, and go out and catch 20, 30 of these, you know, 16 to, you know, 18 inch redfish, which is great because that's a whole year class of fish that, uh, is, uh, you know, spawned out and, you know, settling in into our estuary. So, um, we're pretty excited about that. But the bigger bull reds, like, you know, maybe that, you know, timing of the storm, you know, with Hurricane Ian kind of disrupted that, uh, push of those big, you know, big reds into our area. Um, those overslots, but we're just not seeing them, and uh, that's okay though. I'd rather see those small ones, you know, for to really flourish and do well. Um, but our snook fishing <laughs> somehow is just unbelievable. I mean, it is probably as healthy as I've seen it, you know. Really? And, yeah, I mean, you know, we had the fish kill way back, and um, you know, probably about twelve years ago now, and you know, it's. It's uh, due to the cold, we had a real long stretch of cold weather down here um, that really hurt us, you know, especially with the snook population. And 
Um, I just have never seen the numbers like this in the weight, you know, in weight fall. And it's certainly a big fish, too. And I think a lot of it's probably because they're comfortable and there's not a ton of boats flying around. We talk about boat pressure the last, you know, several weeks. And um, I think we're the benefactors of that, of getting out there and just not, they're just not seeing the pressure they normally do this time of year. So, um, you know, and it's it's been fun because it's all been, you know, catching fish on top water and, you know, hey, I'm going to try this. I've probably tried four or five lures that I haven't thrown in probably 15 years just to see what I can do with it. It's still working. Yep. So, you know, so it's kind of fun to kind of reel that back, no pun intended, and, you know, say, hey, you know what? Now's the time to tinker if they're this cooperative. And um, if you got a preference of how to catch them, you know, or you got something that's close to dear to your heart or, you know, or, you know, you got a tactic in bass fishing even that, you know, it crosses over to the inshore game. This now's the time to try to, you know, try to play that out. And, you know, it's uh it's definitely bearing some fruit for sure. So the snook fishing's been great. Trout are everywhere. Um they're a little bit on the small side, but um you gotta weed through a bunch of small ones, um to get some, you know, sizable keepers and stuff. But the reality is it's action packed out there, you know, between the trout and, you know, the snook fish and, and, you know, the reds are on the smaller side. So we've had a little bit of wind in the last week or so, so I don't really have much from the offshore game. Um, but uh, some near shore bites, we're not seeing, uh, I know a bunch of guys have been running crab traps and uh, kind of the same old thing we've seen the last couple of years. We're not seeing this, this first part of the season. We're not seeing any, um adult fish we're seeing lots of little tiny ones and i'm i'm like almost crappie size now you're talking about triple tail now correct yeah yeah so we just haven't seen that and i think with this big winds we've had um that may help us that may seems like when we get cold snaps and we're at the time of the year we're going to probably get a cold front every 10 days or two weeks and uh, it just seems like, you know, after a couple cold fronts, that, that fishery seems to fire up a little bit. So we might be another week or two away from, you know, some sizable triple tail showing up. So I'm, you know, I'm pretty committed to spending some time looking for them, you know, if, if indeed that happens. So we're just coming off a pretty big cold front that, you know, kind of lasted three, four days here and uh, some some decent wind, so I would imagine we might get a wave of those, you know, either this cold front or the next. So, fingers crossed. Steve, you know it's funny you you were talking about old lures and breaking out lures that uh, you hadn't used in a long time. When I was a kid, I could afford one gold Rapala at a time. Okay, and I would and right. I would have one, and I'd I'd throw it, and I read the instructions, Steve. I was a good boy. I read the instructions. You throw it, you let it lay there until all the ripples go away, and then you yes, twitch sir. it, and you wait for the ripples to go away, and then you twitch it. <laughs> let me tell you something. I I went through uh, many a year of losing one, being irate, okay, saving up enough money and buying another one. And, take, and uh, Steve, last year I went freshwater fishing for the first time in, oh, I don't know, 20 years probably, at least uh, bass fishing anyway. Yep. And I threw a little gold Rapala up next to a tree, and guess what happened? <laughs> we got eight. It got eight on about the second twitch. <laughs> they haven't learned, Steve. Just because we get new lures doesn't mean they won't buy the old ones. That's exactly it. You know, some, some they're, they're famous for a reason. You know, some of these are, you know, are always going to, you know, um, go generation to generation, and I, I'm throwing. I'll be honest, I'm throwing uh, head and torpedoes right. Now. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an oldie goldie. I'm yes, not sir. kidding. I'm throwing head it. and torpedoes for snow, <laughs> yeah. and it is a fun bite to see them explode on that. Yes, thing. it so, is. Yes, I like yeah. the sound of that a lot. Hey, Cap, I appreciate it ever so much, and and so many thanks for the whole year of great reports. And please tell me we can check with you next week. Oh, 100. percent Can't wait. Thanks, Steve, Captain Steve Dahl. Hey, it's finally fall, and how many of us have been waiting for the magic of the mullet run to start? There are literally miles of mullet moving along just about every area of Florida coastline. 
what you need to cash in on the tarpon, snook, reds, trout, sharks, etc. that are feeding on the poor fingerlings is the perfect mullet imitation. Well, for my money, you can skip all the high dollar made in China mullet imitators. For me and all the podcasters I've talked with, the perfect mullet imitation is made right here in Stewart, Florida, and it's the DOA Bait Buster. Mark Nichols, the owner and manufacturer of DOA, spent years designing different bait busters to swim shallow, medium, or deep. What makes the bait buster so special? I'll tell you what I think. I think it's the tail. If your bait buster is moving, the tail is flapping. No predator can stand that tail flapping in his face. The DOA bait buster, it's the perfect mullet run bait. Our thanks to Steve Dahl for our great 10,000 Islands report. Now, let's move up into the big bendaways and check in with Captain Kevin Lanier. Kevin, how are you? Captain Rick, we're just peachy up here in the panhandle. <laughs> yeah, peachy in the panhandle. I understand. Tell me how your fishing's been, and welcome back from vacation. We missed you for two weeks. Well, I appreciate that. You know, we all got to have vacation now and then and, uh, you know, kind of recoup. But uh, fishing's been great up here. The redfish are absolutely amazing right now. We just finished uh, a about a month-long tournament up here called Running of the Bulls. And, right. You know, they put, uh, I think the winning fish was about 46 inches. It's a measure and release. And um, a bunch of 40-plus inch fish were uh, caught, set, pictured, and released. And they're still here thick. And it's amazing. That's fantastic. I got to tell you, one of the more encouraging reports we've had coming all the way down the East Coast and even up into uh, – Steve Dahl's territory is a big increase in the number of rat reds over the last couple of months. I'm, I'm very, very pleased to hear that. That's our future, as you know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I've just been very impressed that the people, I mean, my deckhand uh, has been out there a few days, and every cast yesterday caught a big, nice redfish. Every cast? That's pretty strong. Hard to get any better, hard to get any better than that, Skip. I tell you what, you come up here and fish around the Marine in Port St. Joe, you'll find redfish, especially if you throw out a live mullet. The small mullet, finger mullet, yep. you'll kill them. How good is that? Now, are these overslot fish, all of them? Yeah, pretty much all of them. you got to let okay. them go. You might get one in the slot now and then. But, uh, you know, most fun of all of them is uh, catching them big ones and letting them go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just like we have to do with – oh, I'm sorry. You live on the West Coast. I start to say just like we have to do all year with East Coast. But, no, <laughs> we have to do it over I've here, al- not over there. I've always said you want to impress your friends. It's not by keeping one. It's letting a big one go. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know what? You're dead on, Cap. You really are. And I swear more people are learning it all the time. Uh, it, it's happening in fishing. It's happening in hunting. I was sitting in my stand yesterday afternoon in the prettiest six point walked out that you ever want to see, but he looked young. He just, he just didn't have that older deer look to him. No, you go ahead. Go ahead and pass. Yep, I understand that. You know, I understand and, and, that. And, and, and we're seeing it in fishing. You know, we had a guy, it was funny we were talking about it earlier on the report with David Boris. We had a gentleman that, uh, this week that had a 30 inch trout alongside his boat. And he's fiddling with uh, getting the boga grip so he can get it to get a picture of it. And it came off the hook, and he was pleased. No, oh, yeah. You know, not, yeah and, I get that. That's, that's just cool. I mean, that's that. I'm so pleased to see that. It's it's not so much the change in the laws that saves the fishery. It's the change in the attitudes of the people. Now, the $64 question, I think I know the answer already. How much have sharks impacted your fishing in the last five to ten years? Better than forty percent. I'll bet. I'll bet. Yep. Yeah. You you sent that question out. I've been thinking about it, and I would say, on average, predation takes thirty to forty percent of the fish we hook. Kevin, we just can't seem to learn to keep the ocean in balance, can we? No, we got to put our hands in everything, and we've uh, history has proven that we tend to mess things up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, let's let's work this thought all the way through the reality is and and you were i don't know if you were around back in the mid to late 80s fishing but in the mid to late 80s kevin we really did overfish it so bad that it was on the verge of collapse so i don't ever want to again hear somebody say they need to leave the fishermen alone they'll govern themselves hey kevin no we won't (laughs) i'm sorry i mean no we won't 
<clears throat> Captain Rick, our, our grandfathers uh, did not regulate themselves, right? And uh, that's why we're in the mess we're in. I don't, I don't criticize them, but at the same time, you look back at these pictures of these truckload, uh, yep. you know, dump uh, back of pickup trucks just full of fish. You know, uh, there's no need for that. I mean, you take enough fish to eat, you take enough fish to freeze and eat a little bit. But other than that, you you let them go. You know, I tell every one of my charter customers, you're you get you have to take everything you catch. If not, we're going to release it out here. We're not going to take it back to the dock. Yep, yep, I'm with you. I'm with you. All right, Cap, we appreciate the heck out of it. Please tell me we can check with you next week. We'll be here next week, Thanksgiving right. weekend. And oh, oh, wait. By the way, one more weekend of snapper fishing, and then they'll Shut go. Shut up. <laughs> nobody, nobody east of Orlando wants to ever hear your voice again. Okay, we don't like you right now. Okay, okay but, duly but, noted. But we'll, duly but, noted. But we'll love you again by next week. Thanks, Cap. <laughs> All right, y'all. We appreciate it. One. Thanks, Kevin. Our right, thanks to Captain Kevin Lanier, who had a great report about massive schools of redfish in his area. I'll bet there's some redfish out around Pensacola, Destin Pass, too. How about it, Tyler? You seen any redfish out there? Yeah, redfish has still been pretty dang good. I mean, uh, last year was, you know, so-so for them. Uh, but it seems like any nice enough day to be out there on the water, uh, we're, we're finding some schools of redfish, whether they're in the Gulf or in the Bay. Uh, it's just been pretty good, and there's, you know, big numbers of fish. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're still chasing the, the menhaden everywhere, the pogies, so uh, I think that the bait is definitely the reason that these fish are here this year. Uh, sounds like it. You're, you've uh, you've seen an uptick in pogies this year, haven't you? I think we have on the East Coast, too. Yeah, we've got a real real good year. Uh, a lot of times this, this time of year, the fish are the, the men hating the pogies are all out of the bay uh and they're offshore but we're still seeing the fish funneling from the upper bay system so we're fine we're seeing bait you know all in the bay these are you know the ones that are big as your hand or so um and and the, the you know riding around on the bay you mark the schools see them popping and then you know, when the red fish are on top they're chasing the schools of the bait so it's just been a real good year for that so um you know as long as that bait sticks around i think the red fish are going to be here for a little while longer a redfish will eat a pogey. I've seen them do it. Oh yeah, they love them. Anybody been able to get offshore? Or just too sloppy. It's been it's been real sloppy. We had you know quite a bit of wind. Um, you know I think the, the guys who do uh, we had some snapper days, but I don't know if anyone really made it out. It was just so rough um, the last last you know few weekends. So um, you know Vermilion snapper is going to be a good one to catch throughout the winter time. Uh, we we catch those on on the bigger public wreck. Uh, anything from about 70 foot of water to, you know, 200 foot of water. Um, you know, good fishing for those using cut bait on a two drop rig. Uh, that's something you can go out and, you know, bring back when you get out there. You can keep 10 of those per person. Um, and, it, you know, catch and release a lot of other stuff, you know, coming up. But uh, the Vermilion Snappers is an all year fishery. So that's what a lot of people, you know, end up catching throughout this time of year. Gotcha. Gotcha. Tyler, that's a great report. Please tell me we can check with you next week. I'll be here, Rick. Man, I tell you what, and I sure am thankful for your participation in our little project all year. We really, really appreciate you, Tyler, and I look forward to talking with you next week. I'm glad to be here, and uh, and we'll, we'll see you then. Okay, buddy. Captain Tyler Massey brings our little report to a close for this evening. Redfish has been the fish of the week this week, no doubt about it. Um, rat reds, God, everybody from David Boris down to Steve Dahl up to Kevin Lanier, everybody's seeing a lot of rat reds. That means things are looking even better for our future. I'm very hopeful for the future of red fishing. A little discouraged that everybody had the same answer on sharks. They're having a huge impact in our fishery, and I, I hope we figure out some kind of, of way to settle that. It's going to be interesting to see what it'll be, but we can't let the sharks take over the rest of the ocean. That's for darn sure. Hey, I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know I've got an awful lot to be thankful for, and this podcast is certainly one of them. If you enjoy the podcast, how about letting us know? Go on and rate us, and if you have a question, you got something our guides might have an answer for you on, uh, how to tie a knot, what to use for bait for this fish, you got a question, send it to me, rick at floridasportsman.com, or go on the Florida Sportsman Facebook page, and we'll get it. And I want to send a special thanks as we uh, enter Thanksgiving to the two people that really make this podcast happen, the guys that make it sound good. That would be one Lonnie Pitts and Shelby Busenbark. For Florida Sportsman Magazine, until next week, I'm Captain Rick Riles, and we'll see you on the rip.